is spending more than ever on healthy eating, and the food producers know it. As consumers get smarter, superfood claims get bigger. They say they'll make you fitter. Does this stuff really do the do? Smarter. So this is your brain. Ooh, look at that. Younger. Do you mind if I ask you how old you are? I'd be seven. We're bombarded by words like antioxidants, phytochemicals, flavanols. But what does it all mean? I'm on a global quest for the truth behind the hype. Hello, Morocco. Investigating. How do you turn this boiled soybean into natto? Testing. What is it? participating in the latest cutting-edge science. That's my liver, gosh. It's time Ooh. to put superfoods under the microscope. Do you think this is a superfood? To help you decide if they really are super. <laughs> this week, I'm in Thailand on the trail of our creepiest, crawliest superfood yet. That literally made my buttocks flinch. <laughs> I'm trying an unlikely treatment for our teeth. I do not fancy swelling my mouth out with that. But first... That is Los Angeles. I'm heading to the sunshine state of California to find out if a juice can help a failing memory. Pomegranates have been linked to some pretty bold claims since biblical times. Fertility, invincibility in battle, and even as a way to avoid death. But in the 21st century, scientists have linked pomegranates to improved memory. And as 40% of us will develop some sort of memory problem by the age of 65, if there's something in here which can help prevent that, that's a claim I am very interested in. In Venice Beach, home to the super fit, I'm headed to a juice bar where I'm meeting top juicer John DeLeon. Hi, John. Hi, how are you? Hi, Kate. Nice to meet you. Wow, there's a lot of different juices going on. There's over 60 drinks to vavavoom your vitality or kickstart your karma. What on earth are those? So these are syringes. Um, this one's our beauty. John, where do I put it? What? Where do you put it? <laughs> in your mouth. Only in California. Oh, wow. That was awesome. <laughs> in all this excitement, I've almost forgotten what I'm here for. Uh, I have heard a lot about pomegranate juice. Yeah. Categorized as a berry, the word pomegranate actually means apple with many seeds. Here at the juice bar, they use six whole pomegranates, including the skin, to fill just one bottle. It's everything. Everything is squeezed. Wow, they are so juicy. What health claims have you heard around pomegranates? Um, so they have three times more antioxidants than green tea. Um, really? Yes. They're antibacterial. It's good for anti-inflammatory purposes. And there's claims of improving your mental and visual memory. They say a pomegranate a day keeps middle-aged memory loss at bay. But how? In 2013, a clinical study at UCLA on people aged 50 plus found pomegranate juice significantly improved their brain power. And the research from that trial is continuing 3,000 miles away at the University of Rhode Island on America's East Coast. Dr. Navindra Serum is at the forefront of new research, analyzing which compounds in pomegranates affect the memory and I'm going to be his guinea pig. He's asked me to drink this for four days and produce this, a urine sample. Hi, Navindra. Hi, Kate. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> now, I brought you a little present. This is your urine sample, correct? Yeah. Young Chang, it's all yours? Yeah. Brilliant, okay. Research so far has shown that some people can benefit from pomegranate juice, but not all. Young Chang will look for certain chemicals in my urine sample, which will tell him if my memory could be boosted. That would make me what is known as a responder. So what got you onto pomegranates in the first place? 
It is one of the richest or most abundant source of elagitanins, which are a class of powerful antioxidants um, present in the plant kingdom. And where is it in the fruit? Elagitanins are primarily present in the peel, in the thick rind, and in the pith. If you drink the commercially squeezed juice, you're gonna get the compound because they're pressing that whole fruit. When responders drink pomegranate juice, bacteria in the gut break down the elagitanins, forming compounds called urolithins. Some of the urolithins enter our bloodstream, eventually reaching the blood-brain barrier, a defensive membrane against harmful substances that could injure the brain. But unlike most compounds, Dr. Serum's research suggests that some urolithins can get through. This is where it gets exciting because we believe that the urolithins are able to penetrate into the brain. We believe that once the urolithins get in, that they dampen inflammation and also maybe improve some memory functions. Okay, brilliant. Well, fingers crossed I'm a responder. To be a responder, I need the right kind of bacteria in my guts to produce urolithins. If you have a whiff of the urolithins in your urine, Yong Chang will be able to find out. So, Yong Chang? Very, very strong. Very good news. Good news. Hey, She's a responder? <laughs> Brilliant. In fact, in trials, an impressive 70% of people were found to be responders. Dr. Sarah's work is a small study, and there's more research to be done. But so far, the good news is... When I drink pomegranate juice, my gut bacteria produce urolithins, and chances are yours will do too. The evidence is mounting that pomegranates and the elagitanins in their peel could improve the memory and benefit the brain. I'll drink to that. But not all pomegranate juices are created equal. When it comes to improving memory, you need to drink juice containing the peel as well as the fruit itself. need to do to keep our teeth and gums healthy. Brush with one of these twice a day, floss and rinse with a good mouthwash. Now, a group of European scientists have been looking at replacing that routine with an unusual alternative, a mushroom. Low in fat and packed with protein, we Brits love a mushroom. And we're not the only ones. Chinese medicine has used shiitake mushrooms for centuries to treat everything from fatigue to intestinal worms. Now these supposedly medicinal fungi are being cultivated right here in the UK. Hello. Kate. Lovely to meet you. Dowie Williams has a crop of exotic mushrooms that is just right for harvesting. So where are your mushrooms? In here. In there? In here. There's not much room in there. <laughs> oh, aren't they glorious? What are they growing on? They grow on an oak chip. Each oak chip takes three to six months to produce up to 500 grams of mushrooms. Mmm. I've got a lovely taste of garlic in my mouth now. That's what a lot of people say when they taste a really, really fresh mushroom. Almost a bit beefy. Yeah. They taste delicious, but I'm struggling to see how fungi could improve oral hygiene. Have you ever heard about shiitake mushrooms potentially helping one's dental health? Not dental health, I must admit. Do you think you just throw it on your tooth? I doubt it. But I'm still in the dark as to why these mushrooms might be magic. I'm at UCL to meet a doctor who is hopefully going to shed a bit of light on what shiitake mushrooms have got to do with keeping my chops tip-top. University College London is one of the seven universities funded by the EU to study shiitake mushrooms. So, you need to have a lab coat. OK. Dr Dave Spratt is heading up the research, linking them to dental hygiene. What have shiitake mushrooms got to do with my dental health? There are hundreds of species of bacteria in our plaque, and some are good, some are bad. And what the shiitake mushroom seems to do is to change the population such that we get more good bacteria and less bad bacteria in that plaque. But we don't know whether that's because they're preferentially killing the bad bacteria 
or they're giving nutrients to the good bacteria to survive better. What we do know is bad bacteria will inevitably lead to tooth decay and gum disease. How do I know what bacteria I've got in my mouth? We could easily see the plaque and we go downstairs and look at that if you like. Lovely, right, okay. let's go. Brilliant. Lead the way. Coming up, I test mushroom mouthwash on the great British public. How was that? Oh, it feels like a punishment. <laughs> and I come face to face with some bugs to take on my toughest superfood challenge yet. That is not what I would describe as sweet and tastes just mm. like a potato. One man. The number of children in England having teeth removed has increased for four years running. But now at UCL, Dr Dave Spratt believes there's a new way of improving dental health, shiitake mushrooms. To find out if my mouth is a home for bad bacteria, I'm in the dental lab, using a disclosing solution to show up any plaque on my teeth. I hope my mum isn't watching this. A quick rinse and all will be revealed. Ah! Oh my god! OK. What? Yeah, I've got loads of plaque there. So let's make a mouthwash that you're talking mushrooms. For mushrooms. Yeah. Should we try that? Yeah. Good. To follow this delicious recipe at home, all you need is a blender, some shiitake and a splash of water. Blend for 10 seconds for an eye-watering mouthwash. Oh, my word. Okay. Look at that. Oh! <laughs> I do not fancy swelling my mouth out with that. I really stinks. But first, Dr Spratt needs a saliva sample so he can check how much bacteria I've got in my mouth in order to measure whether shiitake mouthwash will have any effect on my bacteria. Saliva sample done, it's time to swill. It's so garlicky. And it gets worse. Dave wants me to gargle with this stuff twice a day for a week. I'll be honest. However much good this does in my mouth, I'm not sure this mushroom mouthwash is going to take off. I completely off. agree. It tastes terrible. But don't just take my word for it. Do you want to have a go with this mushroom mouthwash? Let's do it. Here we go. Oh, Jesus. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> you really didn't like that. Oh, it feels like a punishment. <laughs> Fancy doing that every morning? No. Or every night before you no. go to bed? It's not good. Are you sure this is legal? Unfortunately, it is. And I've got another whole week of shiitake gargling. <laughs> Torture over. I've sent another saliva sample back to Dr Spratt, and I'm about to find out if it was worth the effort. Nice to see you again. Okay. I'm very intrigued to find out if it worked. So, this is a pie chart showing all the families of bacteria that live in your mouth. The two interesting ones are the streptococci and the prevotellas. The streptococci are associated with, with gum health, so they're the goodies, mm -hmm. roughly. And these are the prevotellas, and they're generally um, associated with gum disease. Okay, so this was what you looked like before, and the huge change that happens after you've finished your rinsing. The amount of streptococci has hugely increased by about 10, 12 percentiles, and the Prevotella has reduced to virtually none. That's it's amazing change, data, yeah. Isn't it? Amazing data. But you're only one person, we need to do this in hundreds of people to work it out properly, but your data's really, really encouraging. The bacteria-busting properties of shiitake are really impressive, but until a way is found to make mushroom mouthwash more palatable, when it comes to shiitakes, I'm going to be stir-frying mine rather than swilling. Protein is essential for all of us. It's one of the most fundamental building blocks in our bodies. And here in Thailand, there's a form of protein they've been eating for generations. Bugs. 
These creepy crawlies are apparently packed full of protein and are even supposed to help buff up your body. I'm on Koh Sound Road in Bangkok and look! We've basically got every insect imaginable, okay? This might be the biggest bug that you've seen in your life. Thailand, families traditionally collected wild insects from rice fields, but some enterprising villagers have found a way of making their lives easier and making some money too. I think we're definitely in the right place. <laughs> that is a giant cricket. We are in cricket country. At Ban Santor village, cricket farming is big business. They produce 15 tons of bugs every month to sell at markets and street stalls throughout Thailand. Mr. Patch started the first cricket farm in Ban Santor 15 years ago. I can hear crickets. <laughs> that has literally taken my breath away. <laughs> Do you think that these can help you get stronger? Would you eat this right now? No, no. <laughs> but before we can cook them, we have to round them up. That is a lot of crickets. Right, so just pick them up. Right, OK. Oh, my word, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. The crickets are plunged into hot oil with lemongrass and local herbs and instantly cooked. Wong Tam and his family eat insects two to three times a week. What do you do? Just get stuck in? Okay. I love that. Oh, it's so <laughs> That's surprisingly good. <laughs> Do you think that insects are good for you? Yes. They've saved the best till last, a local delicacy, especially when it's full of eggs. Scorpion. Okay, you show me what to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so many eggs in this. Oh, stay up, That literally made my buttocks flinch. <laughs> It's so gooey and so chalky and so <laughs> eggy. <laughs> Supper over, but we're not done with insects yet. Some of the tastiest species can't be farmed, so as night falls, it's time to go wild bug hunting. What on earth is this? <laughs> It's very simple, but incredibly effective, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, what's in there? What have you got there? What's that? Can you eat him? Yeah. You can eat it. that. Yeah. That is not what I would describe as sweet and tastes just mm. like a potato. One man. <laughs> Blimey, you're not going to go hungry with one of these, are you? So not only does Wong Tam think bugs are tasty, he also believes they make you strong. But I need to see some proof that these critters are good for you before I eat any more. So I'm back in Bangkok to find out just how much protein insects really contain. Sawadika. Hi, Kate. How are oh, you? Oh, Visit. Hi. Hello. Nice to meet you. you too. You too. Dr. Visit Chavasit is a food scientist who studies the nutritional content of insects. Oh, bugs. <laughs> Look at those. Uh, this one's a fry cricket. Uh, this is a fry um, soup worm. So how do we find out how much protein each of these contains? Um, we have to do chemical analysis. 
visit is going to compare the protein in crickets and silkworms with Britain's favorite source of meat protein, chicken. Um, we have to blend the sample first. Yeah. Once the insects and chicken have been turned into paste, their protein is extracted, separated, and mixed with a chemical that will change color depending on the protein content. They have to make sure that read the intensity of the color. So that one we can get the number or the quantity of the protein. First up, how much protein do crickets contain? So, the result. From the result that we have is comparable to the protein in the chicken meat. So a similar level yeah, of yeah, protein. Yeah, yeah. And second one from silkworm, we have more protein. The silkworms have 50% more protein than the chicken. Other insects have been shown to contain even more. If you dry it out, you can have up to 70%, so it's quite high. Up to 70%? Yeah, yeah. What bug is that? Water bug. Giant water bugs are over 70% protein. That compares to 20% for chicken, 25% for steak, or 36% for soybeans. Oh, boy. <laughs> Even though some insects contain huge amounts of protein, in modern Thailand, people get enough protein from other sources, yet insects are still enjoyed as a snack. So in the past, insects may be one part of the source of protein that people needed, but right now, no more. This is just the, the treat that we want to treat your special friend, that's it. Okay, so what have we got here? This is a queen ant. Boy, I can see her face. <laughs> It's a beer snack with a face. Do you think there's any reason to add these little guys to a European diet? I think in Europe, you have enough salsa protein, right? So, is there anywhere on the planet right now that could benefit from adding insects to their diet? Um, I think in the part that the uh, deficiency and it's very really hard to grow plants, you know, feed animals, like in Africa, insect farming can be the choice. You don't need so much energy, you don't need so much effort to get the, the produce out. But, you know, in terms of having insect as stable food or maybe like as a protein source for long term, I think we need to study. So you've got a lot more work to do? Yeah. Bug appetit. Bug appetit. Well, for most of us, our diets are packed full of protein, so we don't need to add any of these guys in. But for regions where protein deficiency is common, like sub-Saharan Africa or Central America, Farming insects could be a sustainable way of introducing much-needed protein into the diet. Next week, I'm back in California to find out if avocado can make your burger better for you. It's quite dry. Plow on. I head to Scandinavia to see how a sprinkling of cinnamon could control blood sugar spikes. And I'm in Thailand again to see if chilies could possibly take the sting out of heartburn. Wow. It's burning. Burning, burning, burning. And it may not be Thailand, but the Made in Chelsea gang are off to the south of France, where Jamie is wearing a dodgy shirt that he can't seem to do up properly. That's on E4 Next. And John Favreau stars alongside Dustin Hoffman and even Robert Downey Jr. in a movie about getting back on track. The film for premiere of Chef tomorrow night at 9. Next, so here in Channel 4, it's the end of the current run. But could it be the end for someone in Eden? Thank mm -hmm. you.